welcome to the Capital Conversation with me, Michael Heyman. Well, who'd have thought it? It's a hat trick of Heyman's today because I'm joined by Master Gin Distillers James and Miranda Heyman. So it's a veritable triple shot. Now, they are the co owners of Heyman's of London's Gin, the family business that has been serving up cool cocktails for over 150 years. And gin is the tipple that Brits and Londoners love. We buy 60 million bottles of the stuff a year. As the fifth generation of this distillery dynasty, Miranda and James know a thing or two about the spirit of a great business, and a great gin and tonic for that matter, I'm sure. Miranda James, welcome Thank to the you. show. Great, great to have you on, to be on it. I mean, enough gin sold to create 1.32 billion gin and tonics every year. You're on to a good industry, are you not? I mean, Miranda, give us a sense of the industry right now. Well, it's just fantastic. Since January 2018, there are now probably over 315 gin distilleries in the UK, and that's double five years ago, mm. which I think just really shows the current gin renaissance we're all enjoying at the moment. But it's gone a long way, James. I mean, I was just reading here, gin parties, gin menus, gin vent calendars, and even a gin institute hotel. I mean, this, yeah. is, this is a long way from the business that started all those years ago oh, with Heyman's of London, isn't it? Absolutely, it's incredible. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's since, since 1863 uh, to today. I, I mean, my father will say today is probably the, the busiest gin has ever been. We've never seen gin to be so good. So mm. no, we're enjoying it very much so. So give us a sense of the business today in terms of um, the Heyman's brand. What's well, very much we make true English gin, so we very much honour our heritage. So if we go back 155 years to my great-great-grandfather James, um, he had what would be a very small gin house where he was very entrepreneurial and would distill various gin recipes, and we were very fortunate to be able to use those gin recipes today. We also honour the same distilling traditions that he still used. Mm. You've so still we, got one of the original um, brewing, um, what, that, is it a vat? Are they, is they're it? copper pots Copper stills. pots, right. Yeah. So um, we, have, we uh, distill gin in copper pot stills and they're traditionally used to distill gin. They're actually named after women traditionally. Mm. So um, our copper pot still, well we have three. One is named Marjorie after my grandmother. Uh, we have one named Karen after my mother and I'm very fortunate to have the experimental still named after myself to oh, continue right. so, the family right, tradition. Is, uh, <laughs> so you, you don't get a gin distillery named after, well you get a gin no, distillery no, named no, after no, you but I'm, not for the copper pot. No, no, <laughs> nothing named after me. I just arrive at work and there's my, uh, my mother, my sister and my grandmother looking at me so uh, <laughs> oh. it keeps me in my Toes. Did you both always want to get into the family business? Has that always been? Was that always the plan, or did you? Or were there other career options available? For, for, for me, certainly, always since a very early age, I used to go and see Dad at the distillery. You know, some of my early memories have been in the gin distillery and smelling the botanicals. So for me, it was very much uh, the path I wanted to go down. When I finished university, uh, I went and worked elsewhere for five years or so, and that was very much an agreement between both Dad and myself that go and get some experience elsewhere. I found that to be really useful. Uh, and then I joined 15 years ago, so I've, mm. I've been there a while, but yeah. Miranda, what about you? you so, similar, to, similar to James, I actually worked in the wine industry after university and travelled, and I had the same intention. I think Dad always said, try and get some experience elsewhere. So you come in and you've already got some experience from different industries. Our, our James was actually in the marketing industry yeah. and I worked in wine. Did, yeah. did you find as a family business it was easy to affect change? I mean, in your particular circumstances, or were there certain, you just can't change that? I, I think, you know, Dad is very open and we're very open. I think mm. the thing about a family business, you have to stay relevant to what the, the industry you're in today is. So we have some core principles, Miranda's touched on, about how we make our gin, that true English style of gin, which does differ to quite a lot of newer gins coming out today. Why does it differ? Tell, tell us that. Well, it's, uh, you know, true English gin is very balanced. So it's about 10 different, uh, 10 different botanicals that are still together to create one flavour. So if I could probably compare it to an orchestra, you have 10 different musical instruments that play together to create one piece of music. Whereas a lot of gin coming out of this is quite bold, so maybe really focus on one botanical, one so flavour. more like a solo act. Absolutely, like yeah. Or, or, or you know, a, a guitar rock band or something. So yeah, that, it's, it's more that balance of gin, which, which is what that true English I mean, English you talk about, about true English gin. I mean, I mean, is this a shot across the bow of all of these, this plethora of new entrants that have come into this? I mean, you've talked about us also about keeping, keeping gin real. or you know. I think there's a place for everyone in the gin category. And I think um, we have to stay very much true to who we are with our heritage. For us, it's very much making how we can be relevant to today's audience. And I think that ties in with very much there's a real consumer trend for provenance and authenticity. And at the distillery, we it's very much an open space where people can come and really explore how we make 
our true English gin. So people go right up and close. We use 10 botanicals. They can experiment with the botanicals. We kind of want people to really engage in how we make but our gin. Do you gin. think there is a bit of abuse of the cattle going on? I mean, it sounds like, you know, you can almost yeah. just get a bathtub and start brewing <laughs> gin now these days, right? I mean, there's so I many choices. I mean, gin is right in the crest of the wave at the moment. It really is on trend. And we probably have seen some products in the, in the last maybe year or two that have come out, which, as an industry, we question whether they are gin, but they use the gin name because it sells more than if you called it vodka, for mm. example. So there is probably a little bit of that at the moment. So, so tell us about Call Time on Fake Gin. Yeah. Um, that's your campaign, right? It, um, it is indeed. So it was very much a campaign. Um, as James alluded to earlier, we very much felt that there was some, whilst the gin um, renaissance has been fantastic, there's some fantastic new distilleries, we felt that there were some new entrants coming on the market that do they really fit with the current regulations which gin has to predominantly taste of juniper? Mm. And so we had, did our campaign to really see what the industry felt about it. So we wanted it to be an industry-wide, get feedback from the industry. We had a debate in September and actually the overall the feedback has been overwhelming in agreement that um, people want to protect gin, they want to see its longevity. So, so give us an example of a fake gin. What, what is a... I mean, we, we, we took the decision actually not to call out any any other gin mm. brands. We didn't really feel it was right as a, mm. as a gin distiller. I oh, think. It's very popular with lawyers, this show. Come on, that's But I mean, I, what is I, I, a fake gin? I mean, it's, a, 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 it's, it's really something that uh, a gin that doesn't have a juniper focus. Yeah. It may not even have juniper in it, or juniper is, is an afterthought. Um, so you, when, you, when you smell gin, and if you come to distillery, we have juniper berries, and we allow people to sort of squeeze and play around with them, and you really get that distinctive oil. So there's a notes. proper provenance. It's a very the, tiny the, the, note. Yeah. The, the, right. There is. And I think, you know, back to the campaign, for us what's really important is that the longevity of gin and also making sure we, it doesn't lose its structure okay, and, and where so it sits. Th those fake gin distillers, they know who they are? Um, they might do. I think some, I think some probably do. Some, some, some maybe sit on, on the line a little bit. So um. I think because the regulations, um, although the regulations are very much that um, gin has to be predominantly juniper-based and mm -hmm. flavoured, that, um, but they're not enforced. So therefore, um, the, currently, um, that's one of the reasons about the campaign, we wanted to see what the industry feeling was regarding should the regulations be more enforced. And actually, the overwhelming feedback back was yes, they should right. be. So there are discussions taking place on how they can be enforced. So we're hoping that next year we'll see some tighter enforcement of those regulations. So, so you, but you've seen the ups and downs of gin. I mean, we've gone from, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, was, <laughs> when I sort of think back, I mean, it used to be Gordon's and that was, I guess you guys were around, but that was pretty yep. much w what we all knew. But yep. you've seen it from being you know, quite not a particularly fashionable sort of yep. cocktail to being now just sort of riding high. Are there lessons in that? I mean, are there, are there warning signs that actually you can just oversupply the market? And if so, what are the signals? Yeah, I, I think there are, and I think something as a gin industry we need to be careful of. I mean, at the moment it's great, you know, everybody's doing very well and thriving, but as we touched upon, we want to ensure in 10 years' time that gin still has integrity, that you walk into a bar and there's still a good selection of gins available. Now, if you look back you know, over the last sort of 30, 40 years, during the late 80s, early 90s, a lot of acquisitions within gin, uh, they, they got cost engineered, they were mass made, and the romance disappeared out of the category. And I think it's very important as an industry that we keep keep the category alive and, and mm. really keep people engaged in what so, it so is. So when you see something like, like a Sipsmith mm -hmm. acquired, I mean, yeah. what, what, what does, that, does that give you confidence that it's just now part of a much bigger industry being taken more seriously, or do you think the magic is slightly going. I, I, I think, you know, we're a family business, so we differ. I think a lot of people mm. have joined the industry or they've been in, doing something else in the industry and, and, and joined the gin industry as such. Um, does it... Uh, I think it's inevitable. I think you know we've seen a number that have been sold already. That there will be more that have been sold, and some people have actually joined the category to be sold. I think it's a very well financed category at the moment. Gin. There's a lot of people who are able to raise money quite easily, mm. and generally that probably leads to those brands or companies being sold at some point. So. Uh, yeah, I think that's... that's Everyone that. has their own plan as a family business. Yeah. Our plan isn't to sell. Yeah. You know, we you here for, we're here for the long term. Right. We want yeah. to grow and, and, and be here for the long term. And as part of that, you've, you've re-energised the brand, you've given yeah. it a new look and yeah. feel yeah. all out there in the supermarkets. Is yeah. that partly a response to these new arrivals, that actually you have to focus 
not just on the contents of the bottle, but actually the whole brand, the whole mythology of the, of, of the, of, of the drink itself. I think if you look where gin was maybe 10, 15 years ago, it was far more of an entree uh, product. So a lot of bartenders really became very interested. They wanted to make cocktails that, um, with the right ingredients. Uh, and it's moved on from, from there. And it, as we said, you know, we, we want to remain relevant. I think consumers have come embraced the gin category far yeah. more. So yes, we have, you know, we, we have to ensure that what we do today is, is right for what the consumers want today. And, and, and when you talk about that consumer response to gin, I mean, yeah. wasn't that many years ago for, since it had that, that terrible nickname, Mother's Ruin, you know, yeah. the whole idea that gin <laughs> yeah. was a really bad drink. I mean, what, yeah. what, was, what tipped it over, do you think, in terms of the, 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 the image of gin? Well, I think, again, the, the entree to the bartenders and restaurants have really been at the cornerstone of the gin renaissance. I think um, there was a new generation of bartenders that came into play 15 years ago that did a lot of research into the classic cocktails and the classic cocktails are very much gin based and I think um, so therefore the offerings moved away from maybe slightly more of a coloured sugary style cocktail to more serious cocktail and I think it's people started getting interested. So they talked more about what went, what went into a cocktail and they were looking for quality ingredients and the story behind it. And I think the story behind the gin distilleries um, is crucial now. People don't just want to buy a gin, they want to know the story behind it mm. because then they feel they've bought into it. And I think that, that feeds into that provenance and authenticity that we talked so about this, earlier. So this is a similar story to wine, right? In terms mm. of actually changing yeah. consumer expectations, and the rising tide catches all boats. I mean, catches a very old business like yourself. Yeah, no, yeah. Ab absolutely, yeah, no, I completely agree with that. Right, we're going to take uh, just a short break, okay. and when okay. we come back, we move from the business of cocktails to much more about the business of the capital. We'll be right back. Do stay tuned. Welcome back. My guests today are Miranda and James Heyman, the double measures building the gin business that is Heyman's of London. Welcome back, guys. Now, we Thank talked you. about the business um, and how it's grown in the market, but let's talk about London. And mm -hmm. actually, I mean, you're here, you're in Balham. Yep. You had a little bit of time out, and then you've actually built this sort of brand new facility. Tell us a little bit about it. Who's going to get us off it? are you going to get us off? I think it's certainly one of our greatest achievements, um, the distillery in Balham. It's very much um, an open space where people can come. We do tours five days a week. We're looking to extend to daily tours next year. And it's a very welcoming place. We've um, based it on the old gin houses of the 1800s. So it's very much like a home. In fact, a lot of people say they want to move in there. Oh, right. So that's, <laughs> yeah. uh, well, like some waves and strays. Um, everything you need. Uh, so. Absolutely, you yeah. But, but I think very much it's a place that, um, where we can really be open and honest about how we make our gin and really give people an experience that hopefully they won't forget. But a lot of people, James, when they think about London and, you know, businesses that manufacture or make things, is yeah. that London is an expensive place from a real estate perspective. So what, why here? What, why, why back to London? Well, we've, you know, our family started off in London, so it was always important to, to end, end up back in London. We moved out for a short period of time while we found the right building. I think one of the challenges of finding a distillery is that one, it's got to be practical, so you can put your gin stills in there mm -hmm. and, and, and move raw materials in and out. And then, as Miranda said, we want somewhere where people can come and see how we make our gin mm -hmm. and really experience it for themselves. Was, was the brand of London important? Because I always remember yeah. you know, growing up that London gin was a thing, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, you used yeah. to talk about that. I mean, is that, is that part of the thinking I mean, that you want to reconnect? Absolutely. I mean, London and dry gin is a style of gin, but it can be made anywhere in the world, which is a shame that you know the regulations changed many years ago. So London dry gin can be made anywhere. From our point of view, London is the home of gin. It's where it was founded, uh, and it's very much something we want to continue. And it's part of our ethos of our story is that you know we make true English gin, and true English gin was founded in London. So you so. need a part two to your campaign, right? You need to sort of <laughs> keep, like champagne, right? Like, do well, you want London to be a mark? Th 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 wow. There have been some discussions yeah. about actually trying to do more with that, but it's. As always, things in life, they take a long time and, and can be quite complicated in passing them through, but you never know, something, something might happen. I think as well, London is very much, it's almost a brand in itself, London. It's very mm. iconic, and we actually sell to over 60 different markets. So international has always been a focus for Heyman's Gin, yeah. and therefore London's very accessible for our international markets when they come over. It's easy for them to come and visit us, and that's really important to us as well. So just sticking with that international mm -hmm. side a moment, I mean... Yeah. We see the, the turmoil going on around us with Brexit and all sorts of political uncertainty. When you're growing a business that wants to go to those 60 
markets. Do, do you find that the British brand, the English brand, is is suffering because of that, or is it business as usual? Um, uh, you know, L London is highly respected around yeah. the world. I think there is some concern about what's going on at the moment. I'm certainly receiving quite a lot of emails at the moment mm. from from customers overseas about what's going to happen, you know, post March next year. Um, so I think it, it is it is having an impact. Uh, and, and hopefully we can find a, a solution where we can continue to trade as, as, a, as, a, as a country. And your supply chain, does it rely on external export, uh, imports rather? And does how you put gin together? Our botanicals come from, all our 10 botanicals are sourced internationally, but um, we've spoken to our um, broker that we work with and they, they hold stocks for over a year, so that's not a problem. And the majority of our other raw materials are sourced from does, the UK. Does the currency weakness help you? As a business at the moment, it swings and roundabouts, it, what, isn't it? What, what, sometimes yeah. it helps you, sometimes it doesn't. So, what, what, it depends how you invoice and what, what currency you're yeah. invoicing. And so, yeah. it, uh, some markets it's better at the moment, mm. and others not. And when you built that brand, it's on the international side. Yeah. What have you learned along the way? What are the tips to somebody who's watching this think about growing their own business internationally? Are there any golden lessons you share? I think you've got to be committed to it. I mean, yes. there's a lot of people who go, we want to be international, mm. but they don't know how to do it. And they're not prepared to put the time into it. So. I travel quite a lot. You, 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 you travel as well, and we have other people who yeah. do so. So you have to, you have to be committed to it. It's not something you can do uh, part time. It's, it's, right. it's a very full part. Full, you also want to form partnerships job. as well yeah. with your importers. We've worked with quite a few of them for a long we time have, now. Yeah. So you almost form partnerships. You work together. It's really important for them that you understand their market because yeah. every market is different, and every market's at different stages of the gin renaissance. All markets are being touched by by that but very much everyone's at different stages so, so who gets who, who's got the who's got the bug for gin at the moment what, what which countries are the big gin consumers almost, almost everyone every at the moment market. it's, it's yeah. incredible it's, yeah. it's hard to pick up one market that's yeah. grown o over any other i mean a lot of gins being made in those countries exactly. now which which provides a new challenge because you are competing against a locally produced gin but Everywhere. I mean, in Australia now has over 100 gin distilleries. Mm. In 2011, it didn't have one. I'm thinking gin needs to be in that mm. kind of backstop agreement, you know, so that Britain's so, future yeah. could be fueled yeah. by yeah. fueled by gin. Yeah. Now let's just move on. Let, yeah. Let's yeah. sort of um, talk about the two of you as a double act. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's one of those things is that you yeah. know your brother and sister. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how does that work when you're running a family business? I mean, is it harmonious? I think it works works very well actually. And I mean, we have dad involved, and we have dad involved yeah, as well. There's, so there's, 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 there's three of us. There's three of us. I mean, uh, overall, I mean, as a family business, we all want the same yeah. thing ultimately. Um, we maybe have slightly different ways of doing mm -hmm. things, and slightly different ways of thinking, but we all, we all we communicate very well. We talk about different points, and sometimes actually, you know, that's right or no, you're how, right. How so. do you resolve a problem? I think you have to try and listen, take some time, yeah. try and listen to each other. Sometimes also talk to well, someone else. Well, do it my way. Is that, <laughs> well, that, yes, exactly. I'll go with what I think. Uh, or listen to someone else in the team. We yeah. have a really good team around us, and yeah. sometimes it's good to get mm. their opinion. And yeah. we got some, in, with a family business. Sometimes people don't feel they can tell you what they really feel. And I think actually we've got a team that will say, we, we try to maybe really, look at this option. And yeah. I think that actually really helps. We, we, you know, we, we have some really good people yeah. who work for us and we want them to be part of the team. And you know, they've got the expertise and they've got a different thought to how something might work. So I'm always, well, in fact, we always are mm -hmm. when we interview people, go, you know, you're not jo joining a family business to be told. We want you to be part yeah. of it. And actually some people do find that difficult because mm -hmm. it is quite difficult telling a family owner, you know, maybe do something differently. But the ones who are the most successful actually do mm -hmm. engage with us. And, and, and have and some very do, open do you, conversations. Do you aspire for a next generation of Heymans to sort of be running it in the same way as you guys? I mean, do, it would be good. Uh, yeah, our I mean, children what, are quite young still at the moment. Yeah, there's, but, there's, um, a, there's a bit of way. You know, they, yeah, there's, but, they're, yeah, who they're knows? interested. They're yeah. interested. They yeah. talk about it. Yeah. So hopefully. Yeah. I wouldn't want to put them under any pressure. No. I think it, you know, allow them to make their own decision. Yeah. Dad didn't, but you know, we mm. we became involved in the business, just, you know, at, at quite a young age, just by coming to see it, etc. I mean, your boys are a little bit older than yeah. my daughter, so so they they come to the distillery and see mm. it, and, and they've shown an interest. So who knows? I mean, it's it's entirely up to them, but mm. why not? I, I think as well, often the team will suggest us for different things that are taking place. They might think, well, you will be better suited to it, or I might work better, yeah. or Dad, yeah. um, he's you know, next year we'll celebrate his 50 years in the gin industry. So, you know, if people want to... And, and he's still involved, is he? Is he, he is, yeah. he is. Yeah. Very much. He's got a lot of energy for... He does. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he yeah. often goes... So, so it sounds like a very harmonious family uh, business. Yeah, yeah. It is, yeah, it's enjoyable. I think if you... you know, it's, well, I've been there 15 years now, and if you don't enjoy something, yeah. you probably don't carry on yeah. doing do, it. Do you enjoy gin? Yes. Luckily. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily. Well, yeah, I've, I've interviewed yeah. people that actually don't mm. involve... Yeah. I've, no, I've interviewed a coffee yeah. entrepreneur that couldn't stand coffee. I mean, okay. you know, so that's... So you enjoy the coffee. Very much so. And... 
tell us a little bit about kind of favourite cocktail, maybe favourite places okay. to have had, right. a, had a cocktail. Yeah. Well, um, for me, very much um, in the summer, it's very much a gin and tonic. Probably sitting in my garden at home, actually. In the winter, I probably would go for a slow royale, which is a sparkling wine topped up with slow gin as a kind of festive celebration. And um, you can drink that anywhere. Um, well, we're, I'm, I'm sure, party, I'm sure example, viewers will be thinking about that because yeah. Christmas is coming. What, what about yeah. you, James? For, for, for me, I'm, quite, I'm always quite clear. My, my favourite <laughs> gin cocktail is the Martinez. It's made with the style of gin called Old Tom Gin, mm -hmm. which is what gin was 150 years ago. It's a slightly more rounded style. And the Martinez is the original martini. So that, for me, if it's well it made and, and, it, and it needs to be well balanced, then... Whenever I go to New York, uh, they all, the bartenders there really know how to make a good mm. martinez. So that's that's certainly my favourite cocktail, my favourite place to have one. And a final thought: we're just down to the last <laughs> the last few seconds. Okay. As you look ahead for your business in 2019, some of us sort of well, not just some of us. I mean, actually, it could be a very uncertain year for yeah. Uh, yeah. for the UK. What, yeah. Just a final thought on that for growing your own your own business. I'm looking forward to 2019. I think, yeah. obviously, politically, there's a lot of um, uncertainty. But I think the gin category is a very close-knit community. We do support and help each other. And I think we've got no intention of going backwards. Yeah. James, and your final, final word to you. Yeah, I, I think gin's still very exciting. I think there might be some challenges next year. But I just don't think people will stop drinking gin. And, yeah. and I think there's some great opportunities for us. James Miranda, thank you very thank much you. indeed. Thank you. Now, that's it. Time, please. Last <laughs> orders are over. Thank you to my guests, James and Miranda Heyman. They're the double act that are building a great British brand, along the way creating a cocktail of growth and success. And if you're looking for more distilled knowledge of doing business in London today, join me for the next Capital Conversation. And by the way, Merry Christmas. We'll see you next time.